I'm Mike Warlick, Vice President for Defense at FC International. It's my pleasure to introduce our, our, our panel this afternoon. Uh, this will be the first of two scheduled military and, and civilian discussion sessions at TechNet uh, Cyber 2021. This session is entitled Talent Acquisition, Retention, and Training in Cyber. And I want to thank you again for joining us this afternoon. This is a really, I mentioned a moment ago, it's a critically important topic, and it's one that, I, uh, that we'll probably, you'll, that the U.S. is really behind in in many, many ways. And, and part of that is a, uh, in our, our schools and, and colleges. Uh, and what we're finding is that uh, the, 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 the youngsters in th this world need to be smart early on and choose a direction. And this is the this is direction that many of them will choose going, going forward. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our moderator, who is Chief Master Sergeant David Klink. This is Senior Enlisted Advisor. And as the uh, uh, enlisted advisor, Chief Clank serves as the principal military advisor to the director and staff, providing a senior enlisted perspective in global organization and combat support agency over what you heard earlier today, 18,000 joint military, civilian, and contractor personnel in 18 states and eight countries, and that probably changes by the day. All of these personnel directly support the president, secretary of defense, joint chiefs of staff, combatant commanders, Department of Defense and 14 agencies and service components. So it's no small task, and it's a broad, uh, broad responsibility, which includes multiple mission partners and coalitions across the full spectrum of operations and joint strategic and operational support over 200,000 warfighters in 150 countries. Chief Clink, I want to thank you for joining us today. We look forward to hearing from you and your panel, and let's get, without further ado, let's get going. All right, thank you for that, sir. Thanks everybody who was able to attend. I got a lot of my peers out there. I also have my boss out there, which is a great way to do this. Uh, I also know that I'm standing between us and happy hour and the CIO's speech. So I think I got the best slot I could possibly get on the stage. So thanks for that. But I uh, wanted to give a little bit of why I'm sitting on the stage on this topic. And then I'm gonna let my two teammates here on my right and my left introduce themselves. But uh, I, my, as you heard, uh, Chief Clank is a senior enlisted advisor to DISA and to the DISA director. But I, I came to cyber late in my career. Uh, I've only been in cyber and IT for about seven years now. And I, I had what I would call a healthy and a good transition. Some of my fellow E9s helped me with that. You know, they, they made sure I was successful being brought in. But as the, my service and the other services looked to plus up their numbers in the cyber realm, I was brought ac across late in my career. So I don't have the experience of some of my peers with years and years on watch floors, years and years doing PMs and things, but what I was immediately placed on and was a big struggle at AFCyber was IT and cyber talent acquisition, retention, and really the training side of how to maximize those people. So now with seven years in of doing that, and a, two, uh, two major organizations within the DOD. I'm gonna share some of the things, try to dispel a couple myths, and I have a few questions that are, are pre-done, but we're also looking for your questions. So as we get the, later into the panel, anything that you might have, myself, Master Chief Franks, or Miss Augustine are gonna be able to help with that. So uh, Master Chief Franks, if you wanna go ahead and uh, give them your introduction. Thank you, uh, Chief Clink. So, um, I am uh, Information Systems Technician, Master Chief Aaron Franks. That's the long title uh, of my uh, position in the Navy. I currently serve under Lieutenant General Skinner as the Command Senior Enlisted Leader for Joint Forces Headquarters Dep Department of Defense Information Network, where my main responsibility is, a lot, a, a, like my fellow E9s out here, is basically we provide guidance, support, leadership to our total workforce. Within JFHU Doden, that's active and reserve service members to include civilians and contractors along with some of our external organizations like US Cybercom and DIA and, and so forth. Um, I'm excited to be a part of uh, AFCIA Baltimore. It is my first time to uh, physically being here uh, and definitely enjoying the uh, opportunity. And I'm definitely thankful for being on this panel and being able to discuss something that uh, 
is a challenge uh, in the military as we look to further understand what cyber truly is and how to support that from a Department of Defense Information Network and DOD standpoint. Um, myself, I've been in the Navy for 21 years and I've been in IT and cyber. And so, you know, I've started in enterprise networks, I've done information security, uh, government, government risk and compliance, and I was very fortunate enough to be an instructor for the IT schoolhouse where we brought in, you know, 2,000 ITs a year and, uh, and, and also a part of the type of training that exists out there in the Navy and also future type of training that is coming in cyber and IT. So that was very, very good experience and will help me in regards to today's discussion uh, on this panel. You know, JFHU Doden, uh, we're, coming up, we're coming up on seven years and we probably have one of the most complex, challenging and dynamic missions uh, of trying to um, defend the Department of Defense Information Network. Uh, as you heard Lieutenant General Skinner mention, you know, 300 million or 300,000 million IP addresses is something that uh, a lot of people, <laughs> when, you, when you hear that kind of number, you know, it's kind of uh, hard to digest. But understanding how to protect, you know, all those IP addresses, understanding the, the any of those uh, IP addresses could be um, compromised is, uh, is what makes it such a, a dynamic and, and risk. Within JFHU, JFHU Doden, the workforce, those skill sets that we have include planning, intelligent operations, logistics, IT support, finances, you know, the whole gamut. It takes a total workforce like that to support cyber and IT. It's just, it, you can't just have cyber and IT personnel, you have to have all those resources. So talent, not just in cyber and IT, but across all parts of cyber uh, is important. For myself, like I said, you know, my, my fellow brothers and sisters out here and, and fellow um, senior enlisted leaders, we all have the challenge of, of trying to uh, find cyber and IT talent within the services while trying to keep pace with the training and also while trying to re retain them when they're getting offered, you know, a lot of money on the outside. And so for me, you know, that starts with making sure our service members understand joining the military and what that means before they're doing their jobs, right? So tying them to the importance of supporting their country and what they're doing and hopes of retaining that talent. Um, uh, and that's it. Thank you, Chief. All right. So someone who might have more of a challenge that at least yours are recruited for you. Ms. Augustine, for our, on the civilian side, please introduce yourself and let them know uh, your responsibilities and the rest within the agency. Thank you, Chief Klink. My name is Jennifer Augustine, and I am the Director of Strategic Outreach and Talent Acquisition for DISA. I've been at DISA for, oh, a little over 11 years now in various leadership positions, most recently as the deputy CIO before this position. So I'm intimately involved and aware of the challenges that the agency faces um, in its recruitment, retention, and training of our cyber workforce. We all know that the threat environment that we're facing is changing. DISA and JFHQ Doden must have a workforce that is capable of meeting those needs. We've heard the director speak earlier today on the 500 to 600,000 cybersecurity jobs that are currently vacant in the US and the three and a half million that are not filled globally. But MIT also says that even when folks apply for these jobs, only one in four are qualified. According to the World Economic Forum, and the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, nowhere is the skill gap more pronounced than in cybersecurity with the workforce and the individuals that have, uh, are graduating to fill that workforce. So I'm a fierce supporter of the work that DISA and JFHQ Doden do for the department to secure and defend um, the networks 
and defend the warfighter in the cyber domain. We can't do that without a qualified workforce. However, DISA is the most important organization that college students have never heard of. You have movies made about NSA and Homeland Security. Everybody knows the name Microsoft. But you approach a college student and say, do you want to come work for DISA? And they're like, who? What? So I have my job cut out for me because, according to federal fiscal law, I'm not allowed to pay for advertising and marketing of our organization. So how do I reach students, reach universities, reach professional organizations, and get them to understand what a wonderful opportunity it is to work for DISA? So we're working to develop partnerships with universities, partnerships with uh, tech and trade schools, with veteran organizations, professional organizations, so that we can build sustainable pipelines of talent into the agency. Diverse, highly qualified talent in multiple different uh, career fields, not just in IT and cybersecurity um, and, and computer science, but in accounting, budgeting, um, and, and program management, et cetera. So as we work to establish these pipelines, um, we're trying to build the next generation of the DISA workforce and the department's workforce, proactively identifying, recruiting, and sometimes even refining and shaping the skill sets of the students that we're working with. Our partnerships with universities can't be one way. Yes, we're seeking their talented individuals, but we also have things to offer them in terms of um, shaping curricula to address any gaps that we notice um, in the graduating workforce. So I am extremely pleased that the DISA leadership um, has chosen to invest in the, the future um, talent and workforce um, acquisition of the agency, and I'm also pleased to be here on the panel with you. All right, thank you very much. So before we get into a couple of the questions, um, I had a previous boss uh, right before General Skinner down in San Antonio uh, that loved to do a top 10 list. I think he watched too much Letterman, but it was General Wegeman. I can't do top 10 because that's a lot of work, so I did top five. But after doing a few hundred interviews, uh, both down in San Antonio and up here, uh, I'm gonna give you my top five reasons why I see people leave organizations with uh, an IT cyber type organization or background. So, and this is open for discussion. I know the Air Force's recent survey had these same topics, but a different number. Uh, I referenced DICE. If you've never heard of DICE, they put out a quarterly IT and cyber report uh, that's very valuable on what trends are nationwide and in your geographic location. Uh, but without further ado, I'm gonna give you the five, and these are in order. I kinda think this first one uh, is not much of a surprise, uh, but it's compensation of all forms. A lot of people would think that's number one or number two, uh, but usually when I'm talking at, to someone at an exit interview, uh, the money is a discussion, but it's not usually what made up their mind. Every now and then you hit somebody who got this d dream job or they're doubling their pay or something else. Um, but the compensation does matter. It matters to their family. Sometimes it's health benefits, sometimes it's other things. Uh, but I will tell you that compensation is a distant five when I do these. And I'll tell you it's the opposite is most people think, well, we can't pay in government what they pay in the outside. That's why we're losing our talent or that's why we can't get the right people. Uh, I, would, I would share with this audience that overwhelmingly that is not the case, and I'll, uh, both my panelists uh, a chance to comment on that. Uh, number four, I'm, I'm gonna go through the list first. Number four is uh, flexibility of work schedule and teleworking. Right now with the new rules, even pre-COVID, 
there were people that would shop agencies and shop positions based on the number of days they had to come into the office. And that was a very real thing for them, whether it was daycare needs, family needs, and now with COVID and the rest, what the driver was. Uh, but that was more of a real driver for people to either assess or to leave the organization than compensation was. Uh, a third one, and I was just reminded of it recently by one of our workers within DISA, is genuine recognition and appreciation. There's a lot of people feel underappreciated. There's a lot of people that feel that they're in grinding, making the donuts every day, and that they're invisible. And you know they may like what they're doing, but if it's not recognized, they'll tend to gravitate to somewhere else. Number two is uh, usually the most animated conversation that comes in, which is poor supervisors and poor managers. Uh, there is an overwhelming, why are you leaving here? And you'll hear right off the bat, I'll ask that question, because I don't like so-and-so. So-and-so doesn't treat me well, or I'm, I'm sick of X, Y, or Z. Um, that's a very real and genuine feeling, and it's changing and it's driving what your employees uh, make for a decision to stay or go. Uh, and I will give you one data point on that front. One of the biggest pieces you can take with that is those people need to be asked what they're, what they're looking for. You know, some of this poor supervision, you don't have a lot of supervisors that come into work every day and say, I'm trying to suck. But yet their employees feel like they come in every day trying to crush their will. And so there's a disconnect between both sides of that equation. And the more you can draw that together, usually off some sort of understanding, uh, you can mitigate that in a lot of ways. But it starts with being opening to do it. And the last one um, that I, I would say is the largest reason why our agency, why the government, why the military recruiting can keep the talent they get at one third, one half the payroll of their civilian equivalents is because of meaningful work and mission. If you're a part of something that you really believe in and something you really want to do, a lot of those other outliers that I just brought into my top five kind of fall to the wayside. Uh, and the ability to connect our workforce to meaningful work and a meaningful mission makes all the difference in the world. You know, I, I, I still have some offensive operators from my time down in San Antonio. You know, they could be paid tremendous paychecks on the defense side. You know, they could go work for a bank, they could go work for Bank of America, Wells Fargo, USAA, and probably triple their income. But they want to stay in the offensive game, they want to stay in the line of work they love, they want to continue to grow the next generation, and they're giving up huge income to stay in that area and do meaningful work. So those are kind of the trends I've seen out of about five, seven years of these exit interviews and what's there. And I know my panelists are chomping at the bit right now. Ms. Augustine, I'm going to come to you first. What's your thoughts on a couple of those, if you agree, disagree, and what you've seen? So I agree that these five are the top five. I don't necessarily agree with the order. Of late, I have heard, um, and this isn't anecdotal, this is the um, factual, um, the flexible schedule and telework policy has become quite a sticking point um, for civilian employees. And we have lost a number of employees to agencies that guarantee full-time telework. Um, I know that DISA itself is working on a revised remote work and um, telework policy. But the lure of a guarantee um, for these folks was enough to draw them away. Um, of your five, our agency really can't do anything about the compensation per se. Unless, and of course we're talking about cyber accepted service where there is some leeway um, to retain individuals in certain skill sets with um, increase in pay. However, meaningful work, leaders versus supervisors, appreciation and recognition, and understanding, I'll, I'll characterize the flexible schedule as understanding the needs of the employee, work-life balance, all of those can be addressed by 
communication and increased trust amongst the workforce, which I don't know if you want me to go into that now, but DISA has been working extremely hard over the past three or so years to address the culture and successfully increase trust to bring about um, more positive morale um, and more efficacy in the workplace. Thank you. Master Chief, what, what's your thoughts on the, the top five and what I put out there? Uh, yes, Chief Klink. Uh, so I believe minus the telework, which really was brought by the pandemic, I think those have probably existed, those other four have probably existed for years in the military. Um, I think they're all definitely, um, you know, as far as the order, I'm not going to focus on that, uh, but I think they all are, uh, like I said, spot on and probably for a number of years. I know from the military standpoint, the meaningful work is one as an IT that um, has definitely been a challenge. In simple fact that, uh, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, when, for me, when, when we're talking to our service members, you know, I always focus on you're a soldier or a sailor or an airman before you're an IT or, or whatever other MOSs and things that we have out there, trying to get them to understand that the job they're doing is, is bigger than just, you know, being an IT, being cyber, enjoying, enjoying those things, right? They're, they're in the military, defending their country and, and so forth. But that's hard, and then as far as after that, focusing on their job, um, it's, it's a challenge when, for example, and I've been a part of this, when they go through this training and, and they get to their next command and they can't perform any of those things that they've learned because some contract exists, you know, because we decided to contract out the network and so even though our sailors, soldiers, Marines, airmen, Coast Guards are qualified, they can't do nothing. Uh, and, and again, they joined this rate to do this job. They're young, they're, they're hungry, but, they, but, they're, but they're told they can't. And so, you know, that is one thing that when it comes to meaningful work, that's a challenge. Um, I also believe that for the Navy at least, I've asked this question as an IT and cyber is, are we training managers that can just manage these networks and, and systems and stuff? Or are we, are, we going to, or are we training subject matter experts that they can continue to progress and they continue to be able to own things and not have to call some, you know, someone else to do that job? Uh, you know, so from a meaningful work, from a meaningful work uh, standpoint, Chief, that's... I'm very, very passionate, and, and that's what my thoughts are there. Uh, when it comes to comp compensation and, and so forth, I know the services always struggle with what kind of incentives, you know, what, what can we, you know, in the Navy we call them, uh, you know, uh, SRBs, uh, reenlistment bonuses. Uh, and, you know, some, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to get a $30,000 reenlistment bonus uh, at one point. Uh, that doesn't exist for all sailors. Uh, I know other services have the same type of things, and they, they fluctuate, they come and go. Um, but, it, you know, I think there's other ways of, of being able to incentive, incentives, uh, incentive, incentivize the, the ability to train our, uh, our IT and cyber workforce in that, you know, not just certifications, um, but being able to figure out how to train them so they can progress and be able to better um, support and grow their talent at the same time. You know, we have this thing in the military, as you make rank, you have to become, you know, a, uh, you know, a, a, a natural, a leader in some kind of form. But we have tons of, of service members that are comfortable with just doing the hands-on or the technical type of work. And I think we also need to find a balance in that, especially when we're talking about cyber and IT and retaining. Uh, and I think we also have a challenge at hand with, you know, now that, now that we have the blended system retirement, which, you know, 
now service members don't come in and, and, and once they do 20 years, uh, they retire and they're able to draw that pension. Uh, now they have to wait, you know, more, uh, you know, more as the civilian workforce. Uh, and I think that's going to be interesting as the next years come to see how the blended system retirement uh, phases into that. Okay, thank you. So, like I said, I've got a few canned questions here and we'll then go to the audience. One of them is something that you touched on off the bat, so I'm going to come to you first, which is the importance of brand. Uh, you know, we talked about, you talked a little bit about our agency's brand. Uh, how does brand play into not just recruiting, because that's kind of obvious, but how does our brand play into retention and, uh, you know, commitment to the agency as well? To, so we'll say long-term employment. What are your thoughts on that? So you're throwing me a curveball with a long-term employment. So uh, branding with recruitment, obviously, if I haven't built relationships with universities and trade schools and professional organizations and explained to them and then been able to socialize with possible candidates the um, wonderful things that DISA is doing um, in the Department of Defense, then I'm up against, uh, as an unknown, NSA, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, CISA. I'm up against the Microsofts uh, of the world. And so it's critical that I get to share the information. We get to share the information. But when it comes to retention, I think the brand of DISA um, or any organization is key to retaining the workforce because no one wants to work for an organization that their identity is either a negative or an unknown. Um, I can speak proudly on the mission, the efficacy, the impact, um, and the meaningful work that DISA does. And if we are able to translate that so that every employee understands how their work influences the warfighter, how their work is meaningful, then everybody becomes a brand ambassador for the organization. It then becomes a more attractive, more cohesive organization to belong to long term. All right, thank you. Master Chief, I got a question for you on the uh, uh, training front. So you said you, you, you worked at the IT school for the Navy, and uh, one of the, the questions we have is we don't have enough cyber professionals, we don't have enough IT professionals, so we need to grow them. That's something that the services do uh, at the tune of hundreds of thousands across all four services. Uh, what, what is uh, any recent trends or anything? I know that you have all four services under you. Uh, what are we training or what are we doing on the training front to stay competitive, to, to build the right type of soldier, sailors, airmen, and Marines, but most importantly to this panel, the IT and cyber professionals that we're trying to grow and bring into this domain? Uh, yes, Chief Klink. Um, so from a total workforce of all services, you know, they're they're definitely working on cyber training and, and also IT and, and definitely on a focus on cyber defense, which really hasn't been there. Uh, but, but earlier, like I mentioned, right, it's, it's trying to keep pace. And so how do we, you know, how do we, uh, how do the services and the schoolhouses and stuff leverage, you know, not just the curriculum that, that we're building, uh, but also, like I know the, the Navy, we're, we're using uh, college, colleges to, uh, to help with that. Uh, we're also using, uh, you know, certain vendors like SANS and other organizations um, to, to get at that. I also know um, from a joint perspective, which I think is very important for standardization, uh, there's also a focus on joint training, standard, joint training standardization uh, within IT and cyber. Um, so, you know, I think ultimately um, it's a challenge because of the pace that we have to work at. And, and I know that the services are trying to leverage 
more the industry, more the colleges, uh, and so forth to, uh, to try to provide the best training. Uh, easier said than done, though, again, when, you know, we're talking about a lot of this takes long, you know, this is, you know, takes a long time to plan. Uh, for instance, I left the schoolhouse over five years ago, and one of the initiatives we were working has just started coming to fruition. In cyber and IT, we're already behind. Um, and so I know, like in the CTN world, you know, NSA, US Cybercom have a focus on how to continuously keep that training, you know, up to date. And they're doing that by leveraging, you know, other industries and, and, and other educational, um, um, you know, um, organizations and so forth. Um, does that answer, Chief? Thanks, Master Chief. All right. One more for you, ma'am. So we got to talk about this a little bit on the phone earlier in the week. Two of my favorite high school and college programs that we do with uh, to grow cyber professionals uh, was Cyber Patriot. I had a lot of my military members that were coaches for Cyber, cyber Patriot teams. Uh, and I also the DISA intern program of where we get to bring the college students in and we get to see them over there. Uh, what types of programs are you seeing, especially as we shift to telework, especially as stuff is changing, are you finding is the most attractive as you engage with the high school and the college levels for uh, talent acquisition? So <clears throat> I think those that you mentioned still are. The DISA intern program, um, we thought last year uh, during COVID about suspending the uh, summer intern program because the thought was how could we possibly um, bring them in without, um, uh, or how could we bring them on board, that is, without ever having them meet us face to face. Um, these are, are just graduated high school students, uh, those in college, and the overwhelming response from the DISA workforce was don't do that, please bring them in. And we worked to make the onboarding process um, nearly completely virtual. I think folks have to come in now to pick up their computer and the CAC, that's it. And we were able to integrate with specific focus um, these folks who were new to the federal government, new to the Department of Defense, by increasing our mentorship of them over virtual means and providing them meaningful support and meaningful work. The leadership support is key. If you don't have buy-in at all levels for these programs, they won't work. So the programs, um, some additional programs, uh, one that DISA is, has just now become a part of um, the DOD SMART Scholarship for Service program. So it's a DOD STEM program, and SMART stands for Science, Mathematics, um, and Research for Transformation. DOD pays for two to three years of a student's undergraduate or graduate degree. They owe a one-for-one -one service um, requirement in, uh, to pay that back. These are all in research, R&D, and cyber IT fields. One of my amazing interns in the DISA CIO asked me for a letter of recommendation for this program. I wrote it, he was accepted, only to find out that DISA wasn't a sponsoring facility and we couldn't take him back as for the scholarship for service. So when I left DISA CIO and took this job, the first thing I did was contact the DOD STEM office and DISA is now a sponsoring facility to receive those students. So we're seeing folks do our next level leader program. They're very interested in that, um, which are either um, folks that are still in school or have just graduated, recent graduates, the, the traditional scholarship for service program um, run out of OPM and um, national labs, I think, and the DOD SMART 
but it, it takes a commitment on behalf of the agency and behalf, on behalf of the people that the students are assigned to, to be responsible and not stick the kid in the corner shredding paper or getting coffee. They have to have meaningful work or when they go back to their university or back to their high school or back to wherever they've come from, that brand of DISA is ruined for those people that interact with that individual. All right, thank you. So I, I have one or two more questions here, but I'm gonna, I think it's more important to hear from the audience. Uh, do we got anybody out there with a question? We got a mic in the middle so everybody can hear you, sir. Yep, on either side as well. Is this on? Okay, good. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Frank Kidd, uh, computer science teacher, Ellington Memorial High School in Homer, Louisiana, uh, former DCA employee. Um, my uh, I have two questions. First, um, we we just started teaching Project Lead the Way computer science this year, and next year we plan to offer the Project Lead the Way cybersecurity program. So my question for the panel is, um, what, what are the three most important things that a high school cybersecurity course um, can cover? Gotcha, I think you're probably gonna get three different answers, sir, but we'll go ahead and take a crack at that. So I, I'll tell you the thing that, I, you know, my limited involved with was Cyber, Cyber Patriot shaped a lot of what I think high schoolers uh, wanted and wanna know in, in cybersecurity and the cyber area. And first and foremost, uh, they want to understand uh, what the offense, what the defense, and what the, the kind of the rules are in this day and age. Uh, right off the bat, there's some misperceptions out there. Uh, can you hack back? I'm a pen tester. What's allowed? What's not allowed? If they have an interest in this, they've already looked at a lot of the technology, the zeros and ones, a lot of things on the internet. Uh, but getting definitive answers about where those boundaries are and what they should be involved in. And if they do have an interest in offense or they do have an interest in, uh, in heavy defense or something, where they can practice and participate in that. So uh, I, I think the, the rules and the boundaries right off the bat is a really important thing for your, your high school group. The second piece is uh, dispelling some of those um, those myths that are out there on the internet. They're gonna take a lot of what they know in this realm off of secondhand information with their friends or off of things that they've read of themselves, you know, gaming, connecting, doing whatever they're doing. Uh, some of that stuff is gonna be off and gonna be wrong, but they're gonna take it as truths. And so I would say if I was trying to put a curriculum together, especially in the early high school age, it, uh, some of that fact and fantasy. Because I know myself, I was significantly older than high school age when I got to AF Cyber down in San Antonio, uh, and there were still some myths and some things that I was unaware of until I got to join that and get educated on it. Um, I would say those, I know you asked for three for me, but I've got some help up here on stage. Those would be my biggest two, and I, I'm gonna pass it to Ms. Augustine. Do you have a thought on what would be appropriate curriculum? So I have a thought, and then I'd like to get on the soapbox just for a little. Um, so what we hear is the um, computer scientists, cybersecurity folks that are coming in to the agency um, have excellent technical skills, but they have a problem translating them to address real world problems. So it's the bridge between the technical curriculum and the application, the problem solving, the lab work, as it were, that I think is critical and is not always accounted for. Um, that which you can't necessarily get in the textbook. And my soapbox is, um, I have two teenage girls and they go to an excellent uh, high school where I would hope that there would be a standardized um, curriculum to teach them about being a good cyber or digital citizen. There is not. 
They get their information from me and from my husband. So I, it's a, passionate, a passion of mine, and I'm using my um, platform and my current position to work on a national cyber initiative um, with different universities and federal organizations to inculcate a program of, um, call it cyber literacy or digital literacy or cyber citizenry across the country so that there is no student that graduates without a fundamental understanding of how not to click on a phishing email or how to secure their router or what is a deep fake and what is um, manipulated news. If we don't teach our youth these things, there will not be anybody who graduates college who can get a security clearance because they don't know how to behave online. So I will step off of my platform now, my soapbox, but Thank you. Master Chief, if you want to add real quick. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add real quick because I'm actually working on some initiatives um, for some cyber, some, some of the schools with Cyber Day is kind of what I'm calling it. And um, the reality is we saw this with the pandemic. Um, the, the cool word is hacking, right? They want to be, they want to be hackers, right? That's, and then we saw during the pandemic, these students were hacking their own schools. Um, and so, you know, obviously that's a piece of it, but there's so much more to cyber and IT that, that is going to be important, especially when we're looking at can we bring a high schooler directly out of high school into a job? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe even more than just an internship, right? I mean, we're looking at can we actually hire a high school student because we're allowing them, we're allowing them to get certifications at a certain age. We're allowing them to do certain things. So, so to Chief Kling's point, how can we teach them the, the, you know, the, the importance of cyber and IT and all those uh, specific uh, you know, defense, offense, and all those things, um, allow them to continue to certify and educate themselves, but also understanding, uh, like Ms. Augustine was saying, the, the how, to, how, to use it in, how to use it in an important manner. And so that's what I would add. What do you have for us, sir? Okay. Sounds good. Uh, my name is John Santistaban. I represent a company called Aries Security. Um, one of, what basically we do is we provide a, 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 a cyber skills training range to the U.S. military. Uh, basically right now, the, US, uh, the Marine Corps, Air Force, the U.S. Coast Guard are using the product. All of the Air National Guard cyber units throughout the country are using our product. Now, I mentioned that not as, a, as an advertisement, but more importantly, just kind of set the stage because the, the thing that was really unique and why I think it, it makes sense for you guys to understand that something like this exists is that the product itself uh, six years ago did not even exist. It, it, well, it, it existed but not in its form because it was originally uh, designed as a basically a hacker competition at DEF CON. It was designed back in 2009. They said they wanted a black badge event. So our company developed that and continues to run that at, at DEF CON. So basically what we did was create an environment to test the skills of the best hackers in the world, to come up with a black badge event to find out who's the best hacker in the world. Five, six years ago, uh, a very senior person from DOD Education went down to DEF CON looking for exactly that kind of environment that could be flipped around and turned into a training platform, but a gamified tra training platform where people can basically hands-on solve challenges to develop their skills, but then compete against other people and basically get points for every successful um, challenge that they, that they have. So the key there was, and why it's been so successful, is the fact that we use gaming as part of the, 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 the catch because these kids love the game. And like you said, they want to be hackers. So here's a great way to be able to show them and, and use the skills that a hacker needs, but basically use it in a way that can be developed and actually become a mission critical uh, type training platform. But so, to all of your points relative to you as far as recruitment, um, this is a great tool for assessing the skills of potential recruits. For recruitment, basically challenges, kids love contests. We run cyber exercises. We did one for all the, uh, the military academies. Those really bring out the kids that really want to do this stuff. So I, I basically offer that that could be one way of doing this now. Uh, sir, you brought up a great point about some of the challenges of retaining people. 
And I was kind of looking at what we, uh, we provide in our product, and, and all of a sudden I thought I might have answers to some of this stuff. So you had talked about, um, well, one of the things you had mentioned, that these kids don't get enough recognition. Our training is set up so that when an individual completes a section, they can actually earn CPEs. They can actually earn credits. And they basically hit a button, the system recognizes that they succeeded, and it will issue them a certificate, basically saying you completed this many hours, you know, for a file forensics, whatever it might be. They love that stuff. I mean, they put it up on their wall. I mean, that's, that's a form of recognition. Uh, you also mentioned something about poor supervisors. Uh, I think you're all familiar with the, the NICE framework, the NIST framework. Okay. Basically what it is is that they, come in, they came up with, taking, they took a job, decided what tasks you have to be able to do to do that job, and then what skills you need to be able to do those tasks. You can make a supervisor's job a heck of a lot easier. If they've got a kid that's going to be a file forensic specialist, if they use the framework, basically that's the formula for what they need to train on. So you're not going to be training these kids the wrong way. I think that's part of the frustration with some of these kids is that their supervisors really don't even know what they need to be successful. So um, anyway, that's, that's my spiel. But I just want to just propose those things as things that we, we should think about as we try and retain these kids. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. I, and I, I do, to comment on that, I think there's a lot of value in gamifying uh, the training. And that, that's not just for the young kids. We're seeing that within DOD and we're seeing that within the agency and others that if, if you can gamify, put a points-based system and put some things there, uh, it kind of puts hooks in that competitive spirit and people tend to participate much, much more robustly. So appreciate that, sir. Hey, hey, hey sir, so I really appreciate uh, you know, what you said because uh, one thing, yeah, we have nine minutes. and I don't know how many vendors we have out here, training vendors, I've seen a couple out here, right? But you know, one of the things that the DOD, uh, you know, and even the civilian sector, right? We, you know, we pay for these boot camps that are four or $5,000 for a five-day course with the, with the sell pitch that, hey, you're gonna pass this certification, which in the, if you don't even have any kind of background, it doesn't really mean anything. A lot of those cert certifications aren't practical uh, and so forth, right? So, you know, I really liked how what, you know, you guys provide more of, a, um, of an experience and more of a, um, the training that, that I think is needed, um, you know, to actually be able to say, you know, when somebody passes, you know, said certification or something, because they went through some rigorous, you know, one month or, or maybe even longer type of practical process, those type of things could translate and support, you know, an organization. Uh, instead of just, hey, I got my CISSP, which doesn't mean anything if they're going to be working in a, in a security operations center. You know, so I, I appreciate your comments, sir. Okay. I am going to say I see they just opened up the chow line to all of you that are facing forward. So we're going to take one more question here and wrap it up. Ma'am, what do you have for us? Hi, Chief. Uh, Stephanie Travis from Virginia Tech University. First of all, I met you as a lieutenant. Hi. <laughs> Can't tell with the hair down, I but know. hello. Um, so I actually run a DOD-funded cyber workforce development program specifically targeting civilians uh, for Virginia Tech in a coalition with the five other senior military colleges. Um, one of the problems that we have, though, is helping these students to understand what it means to be a cyber civilian. Um, they don't have context for it. So when I'm competing with other workforce development programs that with like Raytheon's and the CACI's and the MITRE's of the world who not only offer guaranteed internships with promises of like a 75% job offer rate, um, <laughs> which is difficult enough to compete with, they can't just go Google federal civilian and have a context for what that means and the way that they can Google what does Raytheon do or what does CACI do. So I guess that's partly an observation, but it's also my question is, how do I help them to understand that? I did 10 years active duty in the Air Force. I understand what it is kind of inherently. How do I help these kids that maybe don't have a frame of reference for what it is, but have a desire to serve, not in uniform? <laughs> I have some of those kids too. Um, but how do I help them to understand what it is to be a federal civilian and communicate that to them? Also, I'd like to talk to you, ma'am, afterwards. Sure. I have students. <laughs> Perfect. So 
what you're saying is so on point. We, let's just take me for an example. Uh, the only reason I've been in the Department of Defense for 25 years is because I was at a job fair when I was uh, in college and I walked by a CECOM, uh, Army CECOM booth, and uh, the gentleman said, hello, how you doing, you wanna talk? And I'm like, I don't look good in fatigues. <laughs> and he says, you do know that we have civilian jobs. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's the first comment I get is, I don't wanna wear a uniform. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so I didn't know. And the uh, OSD uh, did a poll of high school and college students assessing their understanding of the civilian workforce, um, the civilian defense workforce, and less than half knew that there were jobs available for civilian employees, and even less than that understood what they were and how they could get into it, and, and it happens to be because they probably had parents that worked as civilians or as military that transitioned to civilians. So, what you're saying is absolutely true. I face a double, a double um, issue because the organization I work for is not only the, the, the hirer, the, the, the employer of these civilians, but as I said before, DISA is a relative unknown when compared to the larger um, uh, federal organizations. Yeah. So, the only way I've found, because while the agency has invested in our organization to do this business, it's a small organization. There are 10 of us, and it's uh, not as if we have an unlimited budget. So what I have to do, and what I'm doing, is picking specific universities that, for one reason or another, are a good fit for what the agency needs, whether they're geographically close, whether they um, have a federally minded or uh, service minded um, students. Um, do they have a program that graduates particularly um, uh, competent um, computer scientists, engineers, cybersecurity experts, something that, that DISA may need. Um, and then I go and I work with that organization, that university one-on-one, -on -one, and create an educational partnering agreement whereby I put up guaranteed internships. And it's not a one-way street though. Again, we're providing input to the university on gaps that we see in the curricula, things that we need so they can take off their uh, graduation cap and put on a DISA badge. Um, we're uh, offering opportunities to brief uh, their classes and things like this. They can come and tour the agency. But until I have built that relationship with the university, the professors, the deans, and they're socializing DISA or the Department of Defense as an entity that can employ them, I don't know any other way on a mass scale to educate students about the opportunities we can offer. It's a challenge. All right, well, th we're gonna let you answer that one because I think uniforms look pretty good, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little biased. Not on me. Yeah, I got, I got some others out here in the front for you, Rose. They're, they're pretty big fans too, but. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you, ma'am. So, hey, I, I want to thank everybody for sticking it out. Like I said, we had a tough slot, end of day and all the rest, but really appreciate it. It's a pressing, important topic. I'm going to be here for another day or two. If you have any ideas or things that haven't been said, um, please pull me aside or bend my ear a little bit. I'm happy to discuss it. It's a topic we're always looking to improve on. So thank you for that. How about a big hand for this group? I'm going to tell you something. This, this was an elite session. And I've I, I got to add my, my two cents to this. Uh, well, first of all, before I do that, uh, Chief Clank, you and uh, uh, Jennifer and uh, Master Chief Petty Officer Franks did a phenomenal job today. You're, you, uh, you honor the organizations you work with. 
and uh, and you're you're doing you're doing great work, and it's it's critical work, and many of the questions that we had and comments are also the same way, especially down at the uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school. How many of you have heard of the Saint Isidore Award? How many of you have heard of Lieutenant General Rhett ha Hernandez, if you're in the Army? Uh, he was the first commander of Army Cyber Command back in 2011. And as soon as he took command, uh, he came to us, us being AFSEA, and said, you know, I want to I create an award for these warriors uh, so that they can get recognition for some of the work that they do. And the Army's big on recognition of that manner. Anyhow, we took that on. And uh, we, we, we worked together with uh, Army Cyber Command, came up with the name of it, St. Isidore. Uh, we came up with three levels, gold, silver, and bronze medals. You know, gold is an, an elite, nationally recognized. Silver is a really hot shot in the, in the organization. And then a bronze, as you know, you're doing great work, and you could, be a, you could be a PFC, you could be a lieutenant, you could be a major, or whatever it might be. You could be a civilian also. It was not limited to uh, military, so civilian government workers uh, could uh, earn, earn that. So fast forward to where we are right now. Uh, this award, now we, we only award 30 of these awards, five gold, 10 silver, 30 bronze. And that's a limiting factor, but what it does is it gives those people who are nominated and those people that have, have earned the award recognition which you can't give, which you heard from this panel today, uh, if you're in the uniform. You can't get a pay raise necessarily, but you can have, and it's, it's a medal that's not very expensive, but it, it means a lot. And so uh, we're tr actually trying to move this up to U.S. Cyber Command to see if we can't get recognition. Uh, and I think we probably can do that. But things like that, uh, in addition to the, to the, the, to the topics that you talked about today, are what's needed to bring our workforce starting at the earliest levels, you know, before we ever get into the military or before we ever get into the civilian workforce, we got to get smart. Otherwise, we're going to be buried. You know, we're not in the top 10 percentile of, of, this, of this business right now. We're outside of that. And up until about 10, 15 years ago, we were out at, up in the top five of everything. So it, it's come a long way. But anyhow, I, 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 start, I start joining the panel here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I want to thank you for joining today. Uh, those that did not attend today really missed a fantastic session. We do have it on tape, so you have a chance to take a look at it. There is a happy hour that's going to take place right now. Uh, I want you to enjoy that. Uh, we've got a full day tomorrow uh, at, the, uh, at the event here. Uh, and uh, there's also a partners conference, uh, Outreach to Industry by DISA on Friday. For, so, so, so you and the civilian workforce definitely want to be here Friday, I think to see that. Thanks for joining. Enjoy the week. Thanks for wearing the mask. We want to be safe. We're going to get beyond this. Hopefully in January, February, we'll be, be back in the brave new world. Thank you very much.